When I first found you, you were nothing. You were small. Love him or hate him, these creepy animatronics are here to stay. I'm the what from WatchMojo.com, and today we'll be counting down the top 10 animatronics from the Five Nights at Freddy's series. Number 10, Biddy Bab. Yeah, um, sure is stand standing there. He's, ah, oh, he, look at him. He's, he's, he's so happy. Yeah. Oh shit! I made the wrong video. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to my journey to find TF2's worst weapon. If you haven't seen part 1, I recommend watching that first, because this video may be a little hard to follow without seeing it. If you have seen part 1 and want to see more suffering, welcome back! But before I get into ranking, I gotta go over some stuff. Firstly, after uploading my first bad weapon video, I have been told in the comments that the math I used to calculate effective health was all wrong. And I have been given the correct formula to calculate effective health. However, Look at this comment. What does he take me for? Some kind of math nerd, huh? Therefore, from here on out, I will be citing this spreadsheet made by Zesty Jesus because I'm too dumb for math. Secondly, I gotta recap the rules. Rule 1. I will not take random crits into consideration. Rule 2. I will judge them based on their use in 12v12 because I don't play 6s because I'm bad. Rule 3, multi-class weapons have to be bad on all classes they can be equipped by. And lastly, Rule 4, I am not taking MVM into consideration. So before I bore you, let's just jump right into it. I think this stock SMG is super underrated. The damage you can rack up if you're tracking is good, is surprisingly great. And with a little bit of practice, you'll be a lot less vulnerable at close range. One of my least favorite weapon combos to fight against though, is the Jurati and Bushwhacka. Getting one shot by a class that's supposed to be weak at close range is seriously annoying. So what happens if you combine the self-defense and skill of the SMG with the cheesiness and easy to use Jurati and Bushwhacka combo? you get the Cleaner's Carbine. The Cleaner's Carbine has a special crikey meter that can be charged by dealing 100 damage, and when that meter's full, you can press mouse 2 at any time to activate mini crits on all weapons. Now using it with your rifle can be effective, but the weapons you really want to use with the Carbine are the Bow and Bushwhacka. The Bow because with mini crits, the Bow surpasses the 150 damage threshold to kill a medic with a body shot, and the Bushwhacka already turns all mini crits into crits. So that means you get 8 seconds of guaranteed crits for your melee. This lets you go on some seriously nasty melee kill spree similar to the buffalo steak sandwich. But you gotta make sure you're careful because you do have 104 effective health when you deploy the bushwhacka. And I hope that math is correct. When you pull it off, it's like the Jurati bushwhacka combo on steroids. The downsides for the carbine can make pulling it off a bit tough though. It has a clip penalty and a slower firing speed. This makes it weaker for direct combat compared to its counterpart, which can already be pretty weak in combat. I don't suggest running at people with your SMG out to charge it though. The carbine can be filled up either by using to finish off enemies, or occasionally firing it into a choke point to rack up damage. From there you can pop it any time and catch your enemies by surprise with crits. I think the carbine is actually really underrated and underused, but its drawbacks do keep it from being F tier material. So it's going in the E tier. <laughs> this is probably one of my favorite weapons I'm putting on the list, but with that said, I'll be the first to tell you that the shortstop's not very good. 
The description doesn't really do a good job describing this weapon, so I'll summarize it here best I can. Basically, the shortstop has less pellets, but a more compact spread pattern. This makes you much more precise at the cost of your overall damage. This effectively changes your ideal range from about in your face to mid range. The problem with this is that Scout is a class built for close range combat with his speed and double jump, and putting him at mid range can actually be harmful for some of his class matchups like Soldier, Demo, and Heavy, whose ideal range matches the shortstops. Besides the spread, there's also the fact that it reloads its entire clip at once. This is probably my favorite part of the weapon, it comes in handy a lot more than you think it would. Other than that, there's an increase in the push you take from damage. While sometimes it really puts you at a disadvantage, I actually get a lot of use from this stat because I use it to surf damage and retreat. Then there's the shove. The stupid shove. It's absolutely useless. It takes too much time to use and barely sends your opponents flying. But, it's really funny. You know what to do! See ya! Whoa! <laughs> I've seen so many people say they want the shove removed, but I really hope it doesn't. Because it's, it's really funny. And that's all I gotta say about that, honestly. I know I've said some harsh things, but this weapon's actually really fun to use. It's just outclassed and ineffective a lot of the time. C tier. You know, before I jump into the review of the red tape recorder, there's a cool little fun fact I wanted to tell you about. See, when you place it on a building and pay attention to the audio, you may actually be able to make out that the audio is reversed. So if I just take that audio and put it into Premiere and reverse it, you can hear what the actual audio is. The red tape recorder is pretty unique as it's the only non-reskin unlockable for the sapper. Now the Sapper has two distinct uses. The first is the ability to drain a building's health, and the second is the ability to disable buildings. The Red Tape Recorder replaces the health drain attribute with the ability to slowly deconstruct buildings. This can turn a level 3 sentry into a level 1 if the engineer is too slow. However, the problem with the Red Tape Recorder is how stupidly long it takes to go from level 3 to level 1 and beyond. A sapper could have destroyed a building or massively drained its health in that same time. And what good is reversing construction when you can just destroy the building? The red tape is an annoyance and a time waster for the enemy engineer at its absolute best. However, on very rare occasions, the slow speed of the red tape recorder can be its best feature. Because engineers cannot destroy or build a new building while it's being sapped. So for instance, if you're sapping a dispenser, the engineer cannot build or destroy a dispenser until the old one either has the sap removed or is destroyed. And since the recorder takes a ridiculous amount of time to destroy a building, an engineer that has their building spread apart or has left buildings behind will either have to run to take off the old sapper, leaving them vulnerable, or wait a couple eons to build a replacement. So even though 9 times out of 10 the red tape recorder is a downgrade, the fact that it even has a niche use keeps it from being S tier, so the red tape recorder goes in the A tier. Boy, it sure makes sense that this thing is named after a fart, cause it sure is ass. This weapon has gotten a lot of hate recently, and deservedly too due to some pretty big TF2 YouTubers making some videos bashing the weapon. But I have a pretty simple point that I don't think I've seen brought up in these videos that I truly think illustrates the terribleness of this weapon. It takes a minute and a coordinated team to do what the Scorch Shot does with one shot. Yeah, that's about it really. It takes an Eon to charge, needs a coordinated team to actually do any damage, and any damage you deal could immediately just be healed by a dispenser, medic, or health pack. Compared to the flare guns, it just doesn't stack up. The Scorch Shot is, well, the Scorch Shot. And the detonator is already made with crowd control in mind, as well as a big boost to your mobility. And the flare gun provides you with long range burst damage. The gas passer, uh... Passes gas. 
The only use I've found for the Gas Passer, shamelessly stolen from Bad Weapon Academy, is charging oomph for the flog, which, yet again, the Scorch Shot and other options do better. But with this strategy, at least your enemies will hate you a little less? I don't know, trying to say a single positive thing about the Gas Passer is really hard. Also, it can extinguish teammates, which I'm not even gonna bother questioning. I think it'll come as a surprise to no one that the Gas Passer goes in S tier. I'd like to apologize to all of the Pain Train enthusiasts for what I said about the Pain Train being the most forgettable weapon in the game. Apparently there's a big following for this thing that I was not aware of, because like a fourth of that comment section was devoted to the Pain Train. So I'd like to take this moment to talk about TF2's actual most forgettable weapon, the Warrior Spirit. I think I'm right this time. Like when was the last time you saw someone use this in-game? You have not. This weapon has zero users, unlike the Pain Train. If you go into the comments and tell me that you actually use the Warrior Spirit and it's super underrated, you're just lying to yourself. Editor, why have you ironically put up a clip from one of my earlier videos? The Warrior Spirit follows the theme of the hibernating bear set by making you deal ridiculous amounts of damage, but also making you ridiculously vulnerable. The Warrior Spirit boasts the highest raw melee damage in the game, dealing 85 damage per swing, and you get 50 health back for each kill. Which is kinda useless since that's less than a small health pack gives you, but I guess it's better than nothing. However, you take 30% more damage, which means you have an effective health of... Hold on a second... 231 while it's deployed. Combine this with the fact that you're the slowest class in the game, and the Warrior Spirit can basically be unusable. Heavy just doesn't get much use out of offensive melee options, when melees that provide utility are so much better. However, I found two exceptions where the Warrior Spirit has a little more use. The first one is one-shotting kunai spies, since the Warrior Spirit can kill a kunai spy in one hit. So next time you get one of those sneaky buggers in your face trying to trickstab you, send them to the bone zone. The second use is playing Fat Scout. As a Fat Scout, you are much more mobile and able to switch between weapons much more faster than your vanilla variety heavy. So getting the jump on an enemy and taking them out with your melee is much easier. However, I do think it is a bit outclassed by other melees in this regard in terms of utility. But if raw damage and power is what you want out of Fat Scout, I think this is your pick. This weapon gets a lot of hate for the few times people remember it exists, but it's got a couple niche uses that keep it from being in the upper echelons of the bad weapon tiers. B tier. Imagine being outclassed in the one thing your weapon was made for. That's the backscatter for ya. The backscatter deals many crits to your enemies when you shoot their back at the cost of two bullets and a wider bullet spread. The thing about this though, is Scout already has two reliable ways to mini crit his enemies without having to sacrifice their primary, and even if you disregard that, what good is the backscatter if your enemy has situational awareness and just looks behind them? All you have now is a worse scatter gun. Now, ironically, this makes the scatter gun the better flank tool out of the two with its better sustain and tighter spread. However, I should mention that the Backscatter is capable of passing the 125 damage threshold, killing light classes in one shot. And by light classes, I mean tunnel vision snipers because they're the only class you're going to be able to get close enough to. This is because in order for the Backscatter to one shot a light class, you have to be hugging them. This means the Backscatter is outperformed by other options that can both be used to flank and have other positive attributes. I still do have a soft spot for the backscatter, even if it's outclassed and ineffective. Flanking as a scout is definitely my favorite way to play the class, and I even have a strange backscatter with a very refined and very tasteful name that I still use occasionally. But we don't rate weapons by fun here on The What Show, so the backscatter goes in C tier with the shortstop.
Hey, you. You're finally awake. You know, the caber is actually really good. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that it's the best melee in the game. For one swing. Man, this weapon is a real shell of its former self. The Kaber used to be able to one-shot medics. Now it can barely kill tunnel vision snipers. The Kaber deals just enough damage to one-shot light classes, but only at neck breathing distance. Any further and you're leaving your enemy with single digits worth of health, which is irritating every time. And that's even if you can get the darn thing to explode. Because due to TF2's janky melee hit reg, the caper sometimes just doesn't explode. Even if the model of the weapon already has. And don't even get me started on the downsides. For instance, even though it's not listed in the description, the caper has a 15% damage penalty. Combine that with the slower firing speed, after the caper explodes it's one of the worst melees in the game. And think about what this weapon is designed to be. From the stats, it seems like this weapon is supposed to be a Hail Mary play, to be used in last ditch situations where you desperately need to take out the enemy, even if it means taking them out with you. But good luck trying to make those last ditch plays with that 100% deploy speed penalty. It seems like in order to get use out of the caper, you gotta find a new way to use it. Getting a crit with the caber also causes the explosion to be a crit. So if you pair the caber with either the splendid screen or the charge and targe, you can get some ridiculously nasty kills. On King of the Hell maps or maps where your spawn rooms aren't too far away, this strategy is actually really good, as you can leave spawn, get a crit explosion, then duck into the spawn room, rinse and repeat. It's actually pretty satisfying and fun. However, this strategy isn't enough to save the weapon as a whole. It just has way too many downsides and is way too buggy to really be a good weapon. So, I'm putting it in C tier. So the people on my Discord have, have made a habit of sending me bad weapons. So, so take a look at this. 138 new items! And if I just scroll, you just see... All the pompsins and steaks and hot hands. This is, this is ridiculous. I feel pretty bad for what I'm about to say about the pompsin, because it's kind of become my channel's biggest meme. One madman on my Discord has sent me 150 Pomsons and plans to get me to a thousand. So it's pretty obvious the people on my Discord are devoted to this thing for some reason. But with that said, this this weapon sucks, man. Taking a look at the description, things don't look so bad. The only downside is that it deals less damage to buildings. And look at all these cool upsides! But. This weapon falls apart when you read between the lines and see the hidden downsides. The first of which is noticeable the second you fire the weapon. The projectile is slow. For a frame of reference, the Rescue Ranger's projectile is twice as fast, and that weapon's not even designed to shoot people. You're supposed to be aggressive and pick fights with the Pomsin, but if your enemies are not walking in a straight line, then good luck trying to hit them. The weapon also deals less damage than the stock shotgun at point blank range. And while it does deal slightly more mid to long range damage, remember the slow as balls projectile. Another hidden downside is the Pompson has a slower fire rate than the stock shotgun. So not only are your projectiles slow, and you deal less damage, your weapon itself is slower. Thankfully that's where the downsides end, except for the clip penalty. Everything about the Pompson is slow and janky, but maybe the positives make it worth using. Well, the Pompson has infinite ammo, which is kinda useless on the class that's shacked up next to an ammo dispenser at all times, but hey, an upside is an upside. The projectile also cannot be reflected by pyros, which isn't so much of an upside as it is a lack of a downside. But hey, maybe some overconfident pyro might fall for it. Eh. The real draw of the Pompson is the ability to drain Cloak and Uber. <laughs> 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 
Now, Uber is a massive part of the game. It's a game-changing ability, and often Ubers are used to invade your nest and kill your precious mechanical babies. So the Pompson acts as a way to prevent that from happening in the first place. But think about it a little harder. The only time that an engineer and a medic would normally be meeting is if the medic already has an Uber, and by then it's way too late to drain it. So if you really want to drain an Uber before it gets used on your nest, you either need to A. Wait for the medic to accidentally stumble in front of you, zap them with the Pompson, and have them walk over to their team where they'll get it all back in no time. Or B. Walk away from your nest to go challenge a medic in their pocket with one of the least offensively capable weapons in the game. At that point, why not just kill the medic? Going through all this effort to mildly inconvenience the enemy team is terrible. At least you'll be getting more from the cloak drain, because spies are one of the few classes that try to get close to you when you're by your sentry. But draining cloak isn't super useful because draining 20% of their cloak still leaves them with plenty of cloak left to escape. Now something I thought the Pomsen could do is gimp the dead ringer. Because as you may know, the dead ringer takes a full meter to deploy. So if you sap that meter, they can't use the dead ringer, right? Well, not really. See, the Pomsen deals damage first, then drains the cloak, which means instead of being unable to use the dead ringer, the dead ringer is deployed just with 80% cloak instead of 100%. You know, just in case this weapon was close to having a positive attribute. So, yet again, why not just use any other shotgun, even the Rescue Ranger, because all of them can reliably kill a spy. So, let's recap the downsides. Less damage, smaller clip size, slower firing speed, less damage to buildings, and it fires a slow-ass projectile. All of this to be slightly annoying. In the last episode, I mentioned that despite how terrible it is, people respect the bison. People like to get killed with the bison. But people do not respect the Pomsen. It can't even have that going for it. It's a definite S tier. But just because it's a piece of trash, doesn't mean that I can't like it. It's a piece of trash, but it's my piece of trash. We're all about positive morals here on The What Show. Aww. And that's gonna be it for this episode. Remember, this is a series, so if your favorite terrible weapon wasn't in the video, I'll probably dump on it in a later video. I'd also like to thank the awesome people who donated to me, and to viewers like you who got me to 12k subscribers. That's pretty neat. Hope you enjoyed, and see you in part 3. Bye bye now.